The balanced data slate for Warhammer 40k is finally here. Our CSM out of S tier. Our Jukari saved. On today's tier list, we'll be ranking every single faction in Warhammer 40k and discussing the biggest winners and losers of the new balance update. What's up everyone? Welcome back for another exciting Art of War tier list. We are here ready to break down the ramifications of the new Warhammer 40,000 balance patch. Games Workshop just dropped last week their new end of January balance patch. We have a new Unitorm Field Manual, new rules, new index. Drukari is basically a new army. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of new stuff to talk about, and that means it's time to rank every faction in the game in one of our vaunted tier lists. Absolutely. I'm massively hyped for this because the September update saw the game get quite a bit closer than before, but there were still some outliers. This update has got them even closer, so the trend of having a lot of factions in A and B is probably going to continue, but who are going to be the outliers? Who's going to be up there? Who's going to be down there? It's Where are we going to rank them? You're going to find out in this video. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching this when we premiere it, you may notice that this is a pre-recorded tier list. But when we premiere this, we're still going to be in the chat as you're in the chat watching it live. So don't worry if you're putting up super chats, asking questions in the chat, we'll be there with you. We'll be hanging out. We'll be answering your questions. So we won't be answering those questions live because we recorded this a little bit in advance trying out some fancy stuff thanks to our wonderful tech priest button. All right, Richard, I think we are ready to rank some armies. I'm ready. Let's talk about the criteria we're using when we rank those armies. Mm -hmm. So we have these divided into the, I think the fairly normal tiers. We have S, A, B, C, D. Um, and what we like to look at when we're ranking a faction is not necessarily the midline of the faction. No. What we look at when we're ranking a faction is its ability to perform at a high level if played by an experienced player. So when, for example, we're ranking Space Marines, we're not necessarily ranking what do we think the average win rate of Space Marines across all players is going to be. We're ranking what do we think a well-practiced, high-level Space Marine player can do with the army. And so sometimes that leads to maybe some disagreements between our tier list and like a conventional win rate. Uh, we factor a lot of things and we make these decisions. We talk, we think about, you know, what was the win rate like before? Obviously we have new data here, so win rates may be less useful because it's all outdated. Uh, we look at old lists, we look at tournaments, we look at everything, not just, oh, well, it has a higher win rate, therefore it's higher on the tier list. That's not the only thing we consider when we're ranking these armies. Well, let's just start with the first one, shall we? First up is the Sisters of Battle, the Adeptus mm -hmm. Soritas. This army didn't receive tons of changes. They got a couple yep. points increases on key units that you'd expect. They got a couple of decreases on a few things that weren't very commonly seen, but not massive changes in either direction. The things that went up went up a little, the things that went down went down a little, and then we got that triumph nerf. Yep. I feel like sisters are in a fairly good spot. A common theme that I think we're gonna say a lot is that I personally feel like the overall power of the game went down. Yes. So everyone is being graded on the sliding scale of if you got very slightly worse and the game got slightly worse as a whole, you may be in about the same spot. Yep. Whereas if you went up a little and the game got worse a little, you actually went up a decent amount. So sisters, what do they fundamentally do? They are an MSU army with a lot of different units and they have a lot of cheap units. So they're very good at scoring points. Okay, they don't do outrageous amounts of damage. Mm -hmm. They have some damage output, and that usually came through the Triumph Miracle Dice Factory, where you're able to generate a lot of sixes and throw those sixes into all sorts of activations. And I think that Sisters pilots are gonna be able to navigate these changes fairly well. What the Triumph has done has made it less imperative to dump all of your dice into one or two units that get funneled straight through the Triumph into these units. Mm -hmm. You get to spend as many dice as you want. Instead, since you can spend two dice per unit, you'd still have three units put out six dice instead of one unit put out six dice. I think their win rate is probably gonna be about the same as it was in that above 50 category. We're gonna still see good Sisters players piloting it to podiums at large events. Yeah, and I'll also say that some of their, some of their tougher matchups like a world eaters, like a CSM that play the MSU d mm -hmm. game but add a ton of damage on there, yeah. they did get worse. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely a boon for, for the sisters here. So I think sisters are going to be very solidly in the A tier. A tier yeah. all the way.
Let's hit that next one. We've got Adeptus Mechanicus up next. This one's near and dear to your heart, Richard. How are you feeling about the army? So this is an army that uh, has, has been through a, a rough time in, in this edition, in 10th edition. They got one of the worst indexes, but received significant points drops on a lot of units in the September update. In January, um, they haven't received any changes because they only recently uh, got a codex. And so there are a bunch of problems with this army, but let's talk about what it does well. First of all, it is also a mission playing army. This army's damage output is wildly inconsistent for most of the units. There's a handful that have access to rerolls, but they typically don't punch up into like really tough, durable units, um, unfortunately. So, but what it does do well is they have uh, Skatari Vanguard, which give a three inch aura of minus one OC. Not to a minimum of one, just minus one OC. So if they're one, they go to zero. Wild. And they're two OC because they're battle line. This unit is one of the best primary denial and control pieces that exists in the game because of this. And in Skatari Hunter cohort, they access advance and charge. So you can really get them across the board into those nooks and crannies where they need to. There are certain types of units in the game that Admech really can't kill in any efficient way. They can move block, they can try and charge things into them, but killing them, they, they're just gonna exist there for a while. John shows up with his Terminators with two up save armor of contempt and cover, and I'm like, well, <laughs> nothing in here <laughs> can handle that. Yeah, so, so the damage of Admech sometimes we found wanting. I think their mission plays pretty good. They have a lot of cheap resources, but they're a little vulnerable to a stat check, and if the stat check gets rolling, it's hard to stop it. Yeah, and unfortunately, Admech are very much a pace-oriented game. If you can get ahead, you get you go first, you get some board control, you start pinning your opponent in their deployment zone, you start tagging the stuff that can't fall back and do things, then you're feeling pretty good. Yep. Your own half of the board is very safe, you're racking up points, you're denying points, that's where Admech's comfortable. But as soon as the opponent goes first, or they'll be able to push back your infiltrators, and they set up in the center of the board and start projecting threat from the middle, that is very rough for Admech. I think that puts them quite a bit lower on this tier list, in my opinion. Where are you feeling? Because I, I might be biased as I I, I feel like Admech is definitely below average. Um, I personally would be inclined to put them in C tier. I don't think I'm trying to put them in D tier. I don't think that it's that dire for them. Uh, we'll see if anyone ends up in D tier, honestly. Yeah. I'm not, not even convinced about that yet. Yeah. But I would imagine that Admech is falling firmly below average right now. For now, I think Admech is, is one of the hardest armies to play, even as a top player. Astra Militarum. This is an army I'm quite fond of. Um, Astra Militarum have been in an interesting spot in 10th. Uh, they, I think they're one of those armies where win rate wasn't telling the full story previously. I agree. Um, Going into this balanced data slate, they got a rules buff and a very small points nerf. One thing went up in points, it was the Manticore. Manticores were a little bit of an auto-include for guard, and they were propping some things up. I think it was fair. They went up, they're still good. I'm not opposed to taking Manticores, although I think I'm a little less inclined to take three. But then they got a, a rules change, which I, I'm a massive fan of, and now all of their reserve and mechanized infantry and officers got much, much better because now Guard have the ability to receive orders on a turn where they get out of a transport or deep strike in. But it doesn't feel like it's an overpowering kind of buff, it just is a, let's give Guard more lateral options, let's give them more ways to play, and I think that's gonna help Guard players out a lot. So yep. where does this put Astra Militarum now? You got one points increase, and then a lot of your mechanized and deep strike infantry got better by virtue of being able to benefit more from combos. Overall, I see that as a very slight upgrade of the army, but again, in the context of the rest of the game probably dropping a little in power, you move up a very small amount and you watch the rest of the game go down, I feel fairly good about guard. I, I think that what they're good at now is they have very good directional shooting and they pack better indirect than anyone else. We're not at the point, I think, where guard are taking so much indirect that it's the core focus of the army. I think a guard army can still fit three or four very good indirect pieces in and make and that guarantees that they have better indirect than the opponent but then they can still pair with that more things to play the center because again all the transport units and reserve units got better so now they're actually quite good in my opinion at running transports with shooting infantry mm -hmm. inside 
which a lot right now a lot of the transports in the game are transports in a combat unit like chosen sword brethren that's what we're seeing right now i think guard can do just 10 bodies in a transport that have decent oc they hop out they receive an order immediately and they actually can punch in a way that you would want them to and so they have a lot better ability now to play the center um i'm personally inclined to put guard in b tier i think they're going to be higher up in b tier today than i would have put them yesterday but that's where i'm currently feeling okay i mean i don't disagree i played into guard uh, multiple times and I've always felt like they have really good shooting units. Those Lehman Rush Demolishers are absolutely brutal. And how cheap they have for like Scout Sentinels and, and the different Chimeras and stuff, it's, they have a lot of things on the board. It's just a lot of those things didn't really want to hang out in the center yeah. um, or couldn't effectively get there and do other stuff, but now they can. Uh, moving on to the Blood Angels. Yeah, yeah. And I think now is actually a good time to clarify, because this is the first chapter that we're ranking. When we have these chapters that are a supplement to Space Marines, we are ranking them on the potential of that chapter in any form. We're not ranking the Sons of Sanguinius Detachment. We're ranking Space Marines that are only taking Blood Angel data sheet. So they definitely got a nice little update to the Sons of Sanguinius uh, rule which is that they are able to, or there's the Red Thirst? Yeah, I think it's the Red Thirst. Yeah, so they got a really nice update to the Red Thirst rule in which they are on the charge, plus two strength and plus one attack. And that's the point where you can turn pretty much any combat unit into a blender because you combo it with the stratagem from Sons of Sang Sanguinius, Lance. Yep. Um, and Lance is very, very strong. So yeah. these units hit absurdly hard, whether it's Vanguard Vets, Blade Guard, um, Death Company. Uh, you could throw Sanguinary Guard, they didn't go down, but um, they're, you know, they're not the worst unit in the world. It's just an army that can punch up pretty well, and it really likes that a lot of the other combat armies um, got toned down here. World Eaters, Chaos Space Marines, um, because e those units that they were putting out were just way more efficient than the Blood Angels ones. And Blood Angels also struggled a little bit of punching up, and now they have some better breakpoints with that extra plus, extra strength bonus. Yes. They are baseline Space Marines, so they did take some nerfs if you were running scouts or some of these other yeah, uh, units like Inceptors. Aggressors. I think most Space Marines are in just a solid spot. Uh, when you take it as like a top player running the best units, it's just a solid army. For what it's worth, I think Blood Angels are in a pretty good spot. Their data sheets are quite good. Um, you know, Lamarte is an insanely good character. The Sanguine are an insanely good character. I think mm -hmm. the Librarian Dreadnought's actually quite spicy right now. Yep. Um, we've got really good data sheets. I think the Sanguinary Priest is an inc incredible leader. Five of Funeral Pain. Five of Funeral Pain. And plus one AP in combat for the unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got good data sheets like the Ball Predator and the various Death Company. I think Blood Angels have a lot going for them. It's all melee focused, but that's not a bad space to be in right now. John didn't misspeak there. The Ball Predator is actually finally good. Um, it's no. a very good Overwatch piece. Um, it's fast. Just very good at skirmishing. Yeah, and the thing can just it can advance and shoot infantry, so we can just whip like 20 inches around or and just flame things. It's awesome. With that said, they still have the same weaknesses as other Space Marines, which is that Space Marines can be fragile. They're not cheap. You're never getting cheap Space Marines, but sometimes those defenses don't matter, where you know, if you're taking a power armored body, sometimes a power armored body is really tough, and it's way tougher than a Guardsman. Sometimes someone shoots a Meltigan at you, and your Space Marine is exactly as tough as a Guardsman. They're definitely above Admech, that's for sure. Definitely, I'm They're, in full agreement. So I would probably put them somewhere in the B tier. They're monodimensional in that they are mostly a combat army, although you can play like the Iron Storm and bring other guns or the Firestorm version and bring a lot of Inceptors, which I think is, is quite strong still. So um, the, the Codex itself gives them a lot more options than they otherwise would have if they were pinned to Sons of Sanguinius. I think somewhere in B tier is where I'm gonna be comfortable putting Blood Angels. B for Blood Angels, uh, it's not a bad place to be right now. As a matter of fact, I expect they're gonna have a lot of company there. Next up is Black Templars. 
Black it's Templar is sneakily good. Sneak? I, I don't think it's sneaky at all. For a lot of no, I'm saying for the general audience, not for top players. We yeah. knew how good the uh, the Black Templar uh, Gladius was, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of people were thinking, um, you know, mostly about like Ironstorm lists and Vanguard lists, but weren't really talking about Black Templars as much. But they had a really strong win rate. Yes. So you know what, win rates aren't everything, but let's yep. go ahead and bring them up. Before Why the balanced data slate, Space Marines, all Space Marines, sat around a 45% win rate. Mm -hmm. And about that same time, this was just like two weeks ago, last time I'd looked, like right around LVO time, Black Templars had a 60% win rate. Now, all Space Marines received changes. They are all felt equally. Black Templars got a couple specific data sheet changes, not a ton. Helbrecht went up. He was insanely cheap before. He is a little more. I think he's still worth taking. Yep. Then some of their specific units like Crusaders went up. You know, MSU Crusaders. So you take multiple small Crusader squads. You give all of them a melt gun, a multi melt, a pistol, a power fist. And then you just have a bunch of small, cheap Space Marine squads scattered around firing melts into the distance. That was quite good. Yeah. The best part of Black Templars, in my opinion, was the Sword Brethren data sheet. It's a phenomenal combat space marine unit with power weapons out the wazoo. It doesn't have an invuln, it's not that expensive, and it just picks whether or not it wants to be plus one attack or plus one damage every time it fights. Sword Brethren, in my opinion, were the best part of Black Templars. They kept Black Templars as one of the premier space marine chapters in the game, and the part of Black Templars that was best didn't change. Yep. Now their scouts went up, their inceptors went up. All space marines are feeling that theoretically equally maybe Ultramarines more than others. Uh, but the best part of Black Templars is untouched. And I think that makes Black Templars one of the best armies in the game. I would agree. Now, the thing about the um, Black Templars list is it probably, is, the combat version is probably strongest in the Gladius detachment because it gains access to the advance and charge ability and fallback and charge, I believe. But the threat range of this list and then how hard it hits you would often have three bricks that can pop out, and then they just murder almost everything for significantly cheaper. Uh, you know, the Gladius also gives them that ability to spend a command point for Lance, and if they're an Assault Doctrine, also plus one AP. And so you get a Sword Brethren unit, and it goes in charges. And now it's got Advance in Charge, plus one to Wound, plus one AP. What would I like to choose? I'm gonna choose plus one damage as well while I'm here. And that Sword Brethren unit, it's, it's just a power sword. What's the worst that could, oh dear God, happen? <laughs> I think Black Templars are just really good right yeah. now. I think they are just phenomenal. When Jack designed his, um, his Jack Templars, his Gladius version, mm -hmm. he basically said, I want to take the concept of CSM and make it Space Marines. But again, we're talking about a list that lost a little and the meta slid a little. Yeah. But because this started out very near the top, if you lose a little and everyone around you is losing more, I'm inclined to say that they got better relative to the game. I think that I would rank this as S tier, in which S is not beyond broken. It's not a oh, previous S tier. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about beginning of 10th edition where GSC, Eldar, Thousand Sons were just dramatically above everything else. Yeah. Instead, this is an army where player skill makes it such a consistent winner. I personally think that this will probably be one of the strongest armies in the game, in the hands of uh, top players. I could not agree more. On to the next, shall we? Chaos Knights. I do like Chaos Knights. Yeah, you do love some Chaos Knights. And they got a decent amount, of, like a, a swath of changes. Yeah, so no rules changes for Chaos Knights, no problem mm -hmm. there. The Brigand went up, Demon Allies generally got worse and harder to access, and then a lot of the Big Knights for Chaos Knights got cheaper. Now the Big Knights for Chaos Knights aren't the strength of the, the army, let's be honest here. Yep. The rules are mostly catered towards taking several dogs. That's why we see that a lot of competitive Chaos Knight lists are all dogs. If you are playing all dog Chaos Knights, I think your list went up a little bit, right? If you had six Brigands, you went up 60 points. And then you had a couple Nurglings, your list went up 70, 75 points, depending on how many Nurglings you had. <clears throat> that's, that's fine. Yeah. But if you want to include one of those big knights, something I personally love to have a big Chaos Knight, I just, I like having one big knight when I play knights. Minimum one, right? I'm playing knights, I want a knight. 
uh, I think options like the Chaos Knight Lancer became a lot more interesting. I'm inclined to say that Chaos Knights, which were in a fairly good spot, not broken before, are landing right about the same. I think they got a little worse, the meta got a little bit worse, but a couple of build options opened up because the big knights got cheaper. I don't know if any of those are actually going to replace dogs, but the dog list got very marginally worse. Good Chaos Knight pilots can get a lot out of the army, but I also think there is a little bit of a factor of player skill only carries you so far. You've got a good army, but if you have a good army and you roll a little bit bad and your opponent brought a little extra anti-tank, sometimes the, the, the choices are out of your control. I think they're going to end in B tier, but I think towards the upper end of it is where we're likely going to end. I still think they're a pretty good army, and I think good players can do well with them. Yeah, Every agree. army has room for skill expression. I think Chaos Knights are hard to make a perfect event run with. I think it's a very good army for going 4-1. and one. Yep. And I think that if the, if you happen to get it right, 5-0, and oh, totally in reach. 9-0, it's very hard to very do. Hard. You can get a good win rate with Chaos Knights, you can do well, you can podium. You know, if you've got a beautiful Chaos Knight army and you're looking to go best overall, great time to be alive. But I think it's very hard to make that run of, let's play six games in a row, not go second or have my opponent spike saves in the wrong time. Sometimes it'll just happen. All right, next up is the vaunted Chaos Space Marines vying with Eldar for oh. the top slot. No, I, I've seen this before in 10th edition. Once an army hits S tier, GW barely changes them and they stay in S tier for three updates. Come on. Well, that is not the case. So <laughs> this army got a, a wide range of data sheet nerfs or uh, like data slate nerfs to what they fundamentally do. And then they also got points increases on almost every key unit. So to go through a couple of them, their lone obstrat uh, used to be you couldn't target an enemy unit unless you were within 12, is now 18, which is a lot more accessible to actually do wow. damage to them. It's huge. Um, their um, arcs, they, you now can't mix a Ryan, Nurgle Rhino with like a Slanesh unit inside mm -hmm. um, or an undivided unit in Nurgle uh, Rhino, which was typical. So you can't mix and match like that. So you can't get the max efficiency of your strats um, Indeed. anymore, which is a big deal. But we're not done. We're not even close to done. Uh, we're not even halfway done. We have Accursed Cultists, which were very strong because they were a lot of OC2 bodies that could regrow in both players' command phases, and uh, that was extremely pesky. And guess what? Games Workshop was like, nope, they're OC1 now, as a cultist should be. And on top of that, they no longer heal in both players' command phases, just uh, the uh, Chaos player's turn. There's one more still. Yep. Their uh, Profane Zeal Stratagem, which mm -hmm was in contention for one of the best stratagems in the game. It was Definitely. incredible. Top five for sure. Easily. It changed from reroll all hits and wounds for undivided units to reroll wounds for undivided units. Now, let's be fair, undivided units when they packed already reroll once. So for an undivided thing like a Forge Fiend or a Chosen Squad, you go from rerolling all hits and wounds when you use it to rerolling ones to hit and all wounds. But as soon as you introduce a hit modifier, it starts to become very noticeable. Mm -hmm. If you shoot at something that's stealthy and you're telling, okay, now it's fours re-rolling ones instead of fours re-rolling all, that math is different. As well, the stratagem is now only four undivided units. It used to be able to be used on other god units and you would just re-roll ones. You know, in Nurgle, you would, you know, wouldn't re-roll all their hits and wounds, you'd just be re-rolling some ones. But that was a way to make a Nurgle Forge Fiend better and that option is no longer there. Then we get to the points. So we've mentioned a couple of the units. You have Chosen with a Lord, all of that up. You've got Obliterators, Forge Fiends, oh. some of the best shooting units in yeah. the game uh, going up. And then you have a Cursed Cultist and the Dark Commune, which is the character unit that went inside, also up. All of that went up and not by insignia. It wasn't just like a couple points here and there. It's it like went up usually. significantly. At least 10 for everything we mentioned and a lot of the better things like Forge Fiends, um, Lords and Chosen went up 20. Yep. And that means that a, a very good meta Chaos Space Marine Army, think of something like what won the World Championships of Warhammer or the LGT, those lists all went up north of 200 points. Chaos Space Marines were living on top of the heap. I think the last time we did a tier list, we actually put them at the number one spot in the game. I think Chaos Space Marines will become less of a spam army in terms of I have three of this, three of this, 
three of this, it's all amazing, it all kills you. <laughs> Two, I probably have this one tool, I have these couple damage dealers, all different types, and then I have these mission playing tools. And in that case, they'll save on some of these points by not having max of all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I think Chaos Space Marines are a really good MSU army okay. um, and definitely have the ability to switch into that. And frankly, um, I think they will still be able to punch up into armies that are better than them because they do actually kill things very efficiently. Yeah. And I think this will make Chaos Space Marines a little bit more of a glass cannon army because Chaos Space Marines, they're still Space Marines. They're not fragile, but as we mentioned, sometimes your Chosen gets hit by a multi-melt and you realize you're actually just a Guardsman with a fancy hat on. Yep. Because to that multi-melt, you are the same. When I shot Fusion at the Chosen, they all evaporated instantly. It didn't matter. <laughs> you're paying for stats you're not using. So, I think Chaos Space Marines are going to be harder to play, but I think a skill general will still get good output out of the army. However, I cannot overstate, Chaos Space Marine's biggest weakness before was scoring. And they propped it up by tabling people and not caring about the scoreboard until people were dead, or by having so many good units that they were able to score while tabling you. Yes. I think that they are going to struggle to score while tabling you, because now if they're trying to get that same amount of damage to table someone, they don't have anything left over to deploy a teleport. But man, when your opponents make mistakes and you capitalize, you will crush through them. So, where do we think they're ending? So this is where Impressionistic comes in. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I personally find it's easier to judge an army that got massive buffs than one that got massive nerfs. I think this is the hardest thing to judge, which is where we're at right now. I do think Chaos Space Marines got hit enough. When I'm looking at this right now with the factions that we have up there, mm -hmm. CSM do not won't have the amount of trade resources that Black Templars will. No. But I'm looking at Sisters, and if you design an MSU Chaos Space Marine list that doesn't have, you know, six crazy damage dealers, but has like two a bunch of legionaries and a lot of MSU elements to it, that is still a very good army, and that certainly hits harder than Sisters. Mm -hmm. So I'm leaning towards A personally. It might end up bottom of A, um, but I, I, this army has good rules. Yeah. How do you feel? I, I could honestly see Chaos Space Marines being towards the very top of B. However, I think the lower end of A, top of B is, I think they're gonna end up there. I don't know which. They hit Chaos Space Marines hard. Yeah. I think what's gonna happen is short term, Chaos Space Marines are going to suffer because a lot of the players who have been playing Chaos Space Marines not all of them have been playing Chaos Space Marines exclusively for the past five years. Very few. Very few. <laughs> and so I think we're going to see an abandonment of the faction, and that's going to drop their numbers pretty harshly short term. And then I think they're going to start to claw their way back up. Yeah. Personal prediction. I think, I think CSM are going to drop down to a B tier army, and then they might actually claw their way back up to A tier before we get the next bounce slate. Because the next one slate's probably in like April or May or something in that timeline. The Adeptus Custodes, so the Golden Light of the Emperor. This mm. is a faction that got hit harder than Eldar when Eldar were at the absolute peak of their powers. Yes. Games Workshop brought the hammer of the Chaos Gods straight upon them, and Trajan's shield broke. Now, they got some big buffs in this one. They got massive buffs. So, so Custodes, when they took their tumble, they got... They got it because they got the, the dreaded triple nerf. But a lot of people looked at the triple nerf that they received and kind of commented, you know, it feels like they only took two and then they accidentally tripped over a third that we didn't even think about. Yeah. Custodes, when they took their nerf, because they were one of the best armies in the game of early 10th edition. Yep. Top they four, sure. had their unit count uh, reduced so that now their units were smaller. You can no longer run nine or 10 custodian guard, now you can only run five. Yep. Okay. But the units still do the same thing. Then their points took a hit and they got more expensive. Um, and then there was the devastating wound change, which that, that was the one, that was the stray. It's like Custodes got shot twice and then something ricocheted off of a building, hit him in the back while they were on the ground. Like oh, straight geez. into the knee. <laughs> straight into the knee. Um, and that was when devastating wounds changed to no longer be a mortal wound damage dealing. 
and Custodes have built in four plus feel no pain against mortal wounds. They had a four feel no pain against devastating wounds because they cost mortals. Now they don't cause mortals, they didn't have the feel no pain. Custodes got an FAQ. Their four feel no pain from the Emperor's Aegis gives them a four feel no pain against, feel, uh, against mortal wounds and critical wounds from devastating wounds. They now get that back. This is the only uh, feel no pain of its kind in the game, mm -hmm. but Custodes aren't exactly, you know, a dollar, dollar for a dozen. No, they're, they're, they're Custodes. <laughs> It's fair, if someone was gonna have it, it makes sense, it's them. At the same time, they did get some points reductions, but they only went in and reduced the points on the best units Custodes had. So that's a very <laughs> that's a very tricky thing. They only did it on the units that people were already taking. So very interesting balance decision by Games Workshop. <laughs> you know, I, Intercessors got cheaper and Custodian so, Guard. Let me just give you a quick analogy, because you were mentioning Factions that get nerfed very hard and had a lot of people meta chasing on them. Thousand Sons was a good example originally. Chaos Space Marines, another good example from the previous update. Custodes, not many people were playing them after the nerfs. Yes. A couple, like dedicated Custodes players, were still doing that, but very few people were really pushing the limits of what this could do. Now, Jack, over the last like month and a half, has become increasingly excited about Custodes, yeah. just playing his infantry. He would, had no idea what was coming in a balanced data slate, just likes playing Custodes. Big golden men doing big golden things. Yep. And he was running four infantry bricks uh, with some support. Yes. And that list was doing solidly well. It still does very good board control. Mm -hmm. Wardens are insane. Four of Fiona yeah. Pain on a minus one damage, minus one to wound, durable unit. To a farmer That can save. advance and charge into you with a character. Yeah. It's it's really quite a pain in the butt. It's spooky. And um, even with dev wounds, it's not like you're easily chewing through this unit. Mm -hmm. So that unit went down <laughs> and you ran like three of them. And then Custodian Guard, the unit that actually shoots and does combat with all those rerolls, also went down. Sure so did. Custodes lists get a free like full Trajan into their lists if you were running this infantry style build. Yeah. Did, did we mention that Trajan got a buff yet? Well, no, well, I was getting there. Well, go, go ahead and lay it on me. So one of the game-wide updates was in the rules commentary is for ignoring modifiers. There are a bunch of characters, stratagems, different rules in the game that allow you to ignore modifiers to your characteristics. And at Games Workshop US Open events previously, this had meant only your top line profile, your movement, your OC, that type of thing. Everything but your save. Yes, uh, everything but your save, but not including your weapon profile, your weapon characteristics. Yeah. Now, this, some people disagreed on this, and Games Workshop's own design team has now come up and updated and said, it does in fact work on damage reduction, so minus one damage, half damage, uh, minus Our one AP. Attempt. All of that is ignored by Trajan. So that's a huge, huge buff. Obviously other armies in the game have this and it's amazing there too. But this is a big, big update because a lot of Custodes weapons, they're AP2, they hate minus one AP. A lot of them are AP are two damage, they hate minus one damage. Mm -hmm. Being able to ignore all of that is fantastic. And it means they cleave through really strong units like Catan. What? Is that relevant right now? It's going to be when we it's get there. Be. I look at Custodes, and of the top three or four armies from early 10th edition, when the game was just crazy, Custodes look like they're basically the same. And everything that was beating them before, I took um, Custodes to WTC and ATC, to high caliber team events. I lost two games out of, uh, I believe I played uh, 13, both of which were to completely unnerfed Eldar with, with a Wraith Knights staring at me. And I lost both of those games close. Yep. And if you're just telling me like, okay, what if Eldar no longer do that? And now you take smaller, some smaller units, but you get more of them. And CSM doesn't hit anywhere near as hard. A lot of the big damage dealers have been reduced in a significant way. All of a sudden, I'm thinking Custodes are pretty dang good. Now let me add one more thing on there, one John. More. The fact is that Custodes are one of the best anti-melee armies in the game. <laughs> not only are they very durable and hard to interact, like really get through the unit, because if you leave two custodians plus the character, they still smack back pretty it just hurts, yeah. Now, and they can revive a model um, in, the, in their command phase. So what else can they do? Well, on top of that, they have fight first. 
and mm -hmm. charging into a custodian's unit that then fights first into you means your contest plays or your play to actually do damage. Well, now if you're only making one play, you're just going to lose your unit and you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. So now you have to make multiple charges. Custodians are still very durable. The wardens pop their four of Fiona Pain, one guy dies, and now interrupt, boom, they swing on you. It's a problem. They are, there's a lot of armies in here that we're going to see that involve some sort of combat. Yes. To get either get onto objectives or to kill things, and custodies don't care about either of those things. I think that they are probably one of the top five armies heading into the new meta. I technically agree with you, but I will caveat that by saying I'm willing to put them top three right now. Okay, let's move them up. Because, like, look at this. We got sisters up here, Black Templars. Custodians can actually play into that Black Templar list. They could. And I also think, and again, we don't, we could be S, we could be A, I, we could put the top of A or bottom of S, it doesn't really matter at this yeah, moment. We'll rearrange it. But if we're just looking at what's up top right now, if I'm a sisters player or I am a CSM player, I do not want to play against Custodies. All right, demons. Chaos demons. Talk about one of the factions that did get tremendous amounts of love. They had a lot of or a lot of data sheets that didn't really do very much, and um, or they were just simply overcosted. Most of those units went down in a significant way. A lot of these things went down like twenty or so points. Uh, some of the smaller units, five to ten, but a chaos demon list that goes for a lot of the different units now gets like a whole extra like couple units into their list. If you're not running big monsters, most of which didn't go down, the Great Unclean one did, uh, which was already one of the more annoying monsters to deal with, yep. you have a lot of units in demons. They have some pretty interesting mechanics in terms of getting closer charges, being able to go into reserve and then come down 3.1 away. And then they have uh, some scary corn combos. Now that corn is priced uh, where you can actually bring those units, you can stack damage buffs, AP buffs, and all sorts of things to make them hit very hard. We also saw that they got a stealth buff into one of their units in the rules commentary. That's where you can now apply named abilities multiple times on the same target and stack them as long as they don't apply a state. So if you know if a night spinner applies the state, you are pinned while you're pinned X. Pinning someone twice doesn't do anything because while you're pinned X. However, if you point a um, what is it? Skull Master on Blood Throne? No, Rend Master. Rend Master. Rend Master on Blood Throne. If you point that at someone and say, please be plus one, you know, like strength, AP, and damage against it. And then you do it again. Then you do it again. I'm not saying that the world needed to see what would happen when damage five blood letters swung on someone, but someone's gonna find out. Is it funny? God, it's hilarious. Yeah. Is it the best way to play it? Not necessarily, but maybe. And so we see now that corn demons have a much higher damage shielding into one thing if necessary. We'll see how that goes. And then also there are a lot more demons to play with. I don't know how much this helped them. It did help them. Demons were bad before. They were a not very good army. They are definitely better. It is hard to put a pin on how much better they are. I will add that one of the things that stopped them from like being as strong as they could have been in the initial round of uh, like the first couple months of uh, 10th edition was the fact that Space Marines ran tons of infiltrators. Death Watch existed uh, with those infiltrators. And also you had GSC, which was another army that everybody was teching for at the time. Yeah. At this point, nobody's really specifically teching for GSC. They might tech for Hyperphase, um, but I still think that that army is um, if you have a lot of stuff, it's still not, you don't have to like hyper tech for it as GSC just tables you. Mm -hmm. uh, Hypercrypt will chip away at you. I agree with you. It, we're going to see where Chaos Demons fall, but they were ranked, what, C tier last time? They were. They, they were, were one C of the, tier before. They were one of the very bottoms. I think that Demons got better. I think that they're still going to struggle a little bit. One of the things that I found with Demons consistently over 10th edition is that they look scary when you read them. And every time I put demons on paper, it's been like, oh, oh, wow, you have a four-up invuln. Oh my god, you just made six out of six four-up invulns. And then you just failed three in a row against the Melticons and literally died. The other thing is they are one of those factions that doesn't really have things that survive on objectives 
outside of their big monsters, which means the big monsters are staying there and yeah. not threat overloading the opponent. I'm leaning towards lower B tier. I think that's fair. I think they did get much improved. I think that demons always have an ability to do well enough because they have movement tricks. You have an ability to put units in reserves, mm -hmm. and you have an ability to bring them in close, and that means that they can always score points. All right, uh, Dark Angels. They received a brand new codex supplement, mm -hmm. and they are working off the current baseline of what Marines have to offer. So how, do, how are you feeling about Dark Angels? Dark Angels took the same nerfs that all Space Marines took. They did get a small buff, points came out for all the Dark Angels units, and a lot of the Ravenwing stuff got cheaper. I will caveat this by saying that the Ravenwing part was the worst part. I think that the Dark Angel de detachments None of them really do much beyond what the Space Marine detachments do. There's not much reason as a Space Marine player to then become a Dark Angel detachment. The data sheets for Dark Angels don't do much to justify their own existence other than, hey, I'll slap Azrael in, he's kind of a badass. Um, and that's good. Azrael's got a cool new model, I love that for him. I don't think any of that is better than ability to take an Ultramarine character because none of it is better than the equivalent in Codex Space Marines, except for a very small number of data sheets. The comparison, I think, makes them worse than they are. Because it's not that, again, you take a Gladius, it's a good army. You add Azrael, a good character, he makes them better. But as an overall Space Marine player, I should just do Templars. So where do you think this would kind of place Dark Angels? What is like, if they are just kind of baseline Space Marine, where does the baseline Space Marine kind so of fit? I think that Dark Angels are going to end up in B tier. I think they're worse than Blood Angels. I think Blood Angels have better data sheets to yeah. supplement the, the generic detachments with. I think the Sun's detachment, even though I don't think it's crazy, I think it is unique in what it does. Whereas I think that an inner circle task force of the Company of Hunters, I would rather be a Gladius almost every time. Next up is Death Guard, an army that was basically entirely revamped in September. Death Guard, with the changes they got, they got ludicrously cheap for, on a lot of units, they could spam a lot more mortals than most people with multiple grenade strats going off. And they also had solid enough indirect fire. Not oppressive indirect fire, just solid enough. And they really liked the allies of Chaos Demons and uh, Night Brigands from Chaos Knights. If you didn't play against Death Guard and you walked into their army, you found out very quickly that they did insane amounts of damage, which is like 10 Plague Marines hopping out with some grenades and the Biologists and just smacking you into oblivion. It was a bunch of just like AP1 ignores cover. I normally like the Space Marine in cover is like, oh, I got shot by AP-1, I get a 3 if I'm an infantry model in 10th edition, I just kind of have cover by existing on accident. By the way, you're a 4 bummer, save AP-1, by the way, it's ignore cover, take a 5 up from my AP-1 flame, or that's anti-infantry 2 plus, oh, hold on, take 25 ups. And there was a famous game we played on YouTube where um, Jack was playing Thousand Sons, walked up, did quite a bit of damage into the Death Guard. Quinton then dropped everything out and absolutely obliterated uh, a bunch of fairly durable bodies for like what you would assume random plate marine stuff would do into, mm -hmm. and he just cleaved through them with ease. So close range, this army did insane amounts of damage. Now they've put a couple changes on them. One is that you can use the grenade strat and then use the biologist to do one additional time, yeah. but you can't pop three biologists plus the grenade strat all at once. Then they got some increases. Plague Marines went up a bit, then um, the Chaos Knight Brigands went up a bit and their mm -hmm. Nurglings went up a little, up bit. a little bit. So your army did get a decent increase, but it is still quite a solid army, I would yeah. imagine. Honestly, just dropping like a brigand and adding some other Death Guard piece mm -hmm. is probably gonna get you very close okay. to where you were. Or some of their things did get cheaper as well. Yep. Death Shroud Terminators, the Lord of Virulence, Typhus. Typhus went down 20 points. Death Shroud Terminators went down. If you take, I think if you take a six man Death Shroud and Typhus, that unit went down 30 or 40 points. I like Death Guard right now. They were, they were in a good spot before. They were firmly above average. 
they actually had a solid matchup in Eldar, a rarity. I'm just gonna check your pulse real quick, because you said you, uh... <laughs> I know. <laughs> you hear I, We spent so many tier lists so many years. D for Death Guard. <laughs> we named D tier after them. Um, and they but, just don't live there anymore. They, they went out to buy milk, and they got lost in A tier. On to the next, shall we? This is an army that... Uh, <laughs> it's an army we both like. Yeah, it is the Death Watch. So, um, they were an army that was extremely strong in the first couple months of the edition, and then in the September update, they took a significant nerf to how their stratagems interact with some of the weapons. Uh, I think they took the biggest nerf in the game in the September Worlds patch. Basically, their damage output dramatically declined in such in a way that they don't really do damage better than any of the other Space Marine chapters. They have three taken infantry units, spend a CP, it shoots harder in this way. All three of those stratagems got taken from ranged attacks to ranged attacks with bolt weapons. That's cool. Now, Death Watch also gets a lot of unique units. They got all these unique, uh, you know, kill teams. The Proteus kill team and the veteran, veterans. Yep. Those units don't actually really take many bolters. But they take assault cannons, or cyclone missile launchers, okay. frag cannons. Yep. And or xenophase blades and storm shields. You take a. You can still take the bolt weapons. But here's an awkward thing, and I think this has really been to Death Watch's disadvantage. When they made War Year free, they made the bolt gun. And the frag cannon, the same cost. Now you don't get they your got, special strats. Now you don't get your strats synergy. And so that's put Death Watch in a weird spot. Death Watch have actually still been able to string together some success. But in this balanced data slate, they took no love at all. And took the Space Marine nerfs. They took all the Space Marine nerfs with no buffs at all. But they also actually, they I think they took the Space Marine nerfs harder than the average chapter because in order to get use out of their stratagems, they would take aggressors and inceptors so that they had a good bolt weapon unit that was fairly costed for taking a bolt weapon. So where are you feeling? Because like, when I look at their rules, they're, they can't be that much worse than Blood Angels or Dark Angels, right? With how our ranking is, you can take Death Watch and run a Space Marine Gladius with no Death Watch units in it. Sure. I'm not going to rank it on that. Because that, if you're not taking a Death Watch unit, that doesn't count. Yeah. Um, I feel like Death Watch are worse than Dark Angels. It's so expensive to take those units, and using the strats is so hard right now. Because like, what what unit am I using special issue ammo on? I'm inclined to say that they are C tier personally. I think they're low. I, I, I hate to say it. I love Death Watch. And you know what? This is an invitation for Death Watch players to come beat me at a tournament, you know, TikTok dance over my crying body under the table, and say, who's C tier now? You can do what Kaladner did to me with sisters. <laughs> All right, next up we have the, the Drukhari. An army that was ranked, was it ranked bottom? It was- Last time? It, was close. It might have been. I it think was it was one of the bottom three. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no doubt. I think it actually was. Their issue was first of all, they're paper thin. They also were mostly a shooting army that didn't shoot very hard. So, Games Workshop has said we understand it was a mistake. Our bad. Drukhari get buffs, and so the, not only did they get a wide uh, range of points decreases, mm -hmm. further points decreases. So now they have a lot of stuff that's pretty darn cheap. They got some significant buffs. First of all, if you empower a unit with the pain tokens, in melee, you'll also get plus one AP, which, okay, a lot of their stuff lost AP going into the addition, uh, like a lot of armies, mm -hmm. and a lot of it went from like AP1 to AP0, or AP2 to AP1, now is going back up uh, yep. when you used uh, that, that rule. In addition to that, you have a brand new detachment, the Sky Splinter Assault uh, Force. And this detachment has is just player skill central. Yes. It has a lot of janky, weird combos that you can do, such as getting uh, units into a transport uh, after you have fought at the end of the flight phase. That's super good. That you can, good. if your opponent ends a move uh, close to your transports, you can then move the transport. Um, there are other abilities like being able to get access to Lance plus one AP, Lance, full rerolls to hit, 
Archons can now go into Incubi units, which allows them to access reroll wounds. There's a lot of ways to punch up with very cheap, hard-hitting units. And that's exactly what Jukari did super well in 9th edition. And once again, we are much closer to Jukari playing in a similar style. It's that they lost nothing. Mm -hmm. If you think about what Jukari did before, you may not even remember, wait, how much of this was the detachment? None of it. None of it was the detachment. The old detachment was probably the worst one I have seen. It is comparable to the worst attachments and the worst codexes we've had so far, and it might even be worse than that. You got a lot. Now they're still fragile. They still have still flaws. Fragile. They hit much harder than before, but you know what? If you take strength 4 AP2 and you give it plus one, plus one, plus reroll, plus reroll, it is a lot better. It is still not necessarily killing T12 AP to a armor save, minus one damage at an appreciable speed. <laughs> I think this was an, a phenomenal step. It's actually, I think, my single favorite part of this data slate is that they were willing to make a new type of change for struggling armies. 100% agree on that because ultimately, Jukari was an army that didn't function as an army should. Jukari now are playing like an army that does some amount of shooting and has some hard-hitting combat units. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then like I mentioned, the strats all, if you are a very good player and can see the different lines, you will get a lot more out of this Drakari detachment, which yes. is, that's a well-designed, well-thought-out detachment, and Games Workshop did amazingly well with it. Yeah. Trying to express skill with Drakari before felt like you could pirouette and tightrope through a hoop and then hit your opponent with a noodle and they would just look at you and it'd be like the Indiana Jones sword scene, right? You know, yeah. you're being fancy and Indiana Jones is <laughs> like, oh, you're really expressive, you're, you're a really good player, Sean, Nathan, and Andrew Kari. Unfortunately for you, I spent a command point and your army had zero AP. Bang. <laughs> like, nothing you can do, sorry. Now, where does it fit? That is a question. Jukar, a brand new army. their fundamental weakness, in my opinion, is not as much the damage now, although it's still on the lower half of armies. Mm -hmm. It is the fact that what holds primary? I think that they hold objectives by pushing past them. Some armies hold an objective by putting a custodian guard unit on it, and it's the front thing, but it's on that objective, and to take it off, you gotta come take them off. Not a perfect plan, no. but it's better than what they had last week, because you'll actually last more than one turn doing it. So, the question is, where do we think a player uh, like a Quinn or a Scari can bring this new set of rules up? I'm inclined to say that Drukari are better than some Space Marines, but not all of them. I think they're gonna, I think I'm gonna call the shot that they're gonna land in B tier. I would not be surprised if by the end of this, great Drukari players were going out there and beating A tier factions. But I, I'm not comfortable putting Drukari in A tier yet. If someone just goes first and then on turn two the reserves come in and I, you just kill a bunch of transports. And you'd say, okay, I killed all your transports. What's your special rule again? And they say, oh, it's um, when I disembark from a transport I get something. That's gone. How are your stratagems? Well, uh, four of them have the keyword transport bolded in them. I'm willing to put them between Blood Angels and Dark Angels here. Mm -hmm. In that area. Yeah, I, I could even see them a little higher than that, but not much. Yeah. Let's, but let's I go think, ahead. I think in that ballpark feels right. All right, Al Dari. All right, let's go. So, this is an army that has dominated 10th edition since its inception. Yes. And it has been the strongest set of rules that you could access as a top player. And that is why many top players flocked to them for the first several months. Chaos Space Marines offered a second alternative mm -hmm. uh, with the September update kind of after that point when Aldari actually got a like more significant or all that. Yep. I mean, that was like the third nerf they got. But <laughs> the then CSM are now something that can actually play into the Eldar meta. And then there was always off-meta stuff like Necrons that happened to be good into Aldari. Mm -hmm. But Aldari suppressed an, an amazing amount of the game and an amazing amount of options in codexes simply weren't viable because you could play Aldari with Wraith Guard or 
might night spinners or stuff like this. And they received the largest single nerf I have seen of 10th edition, I think, but it's one of those funny things where that doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. A lot, almost every key interaction got nerfed, and then there were two units, Night Spinners and also the uh, Wraith Guard, that went up. Now, an Aldari Metalist, if you took three spinners, that would be 90 points, and then if you took a Wraith Guard unit, that'd be 40 more points for 130 points, which means you're dropping a thing, possibly a spinner and getting a bunch of points back. Yeah. That's still a pretty good list, frankly. Yeah. What did they lose army-wide? Well, Fate Dice is now capped at six. Okay, you don't just have an infinite pool to use every single time that you want to. Good. There are, now it does mean uh, the things that adjust Fate Dice or add them like Eldrad or Guardians on Objectives or some of these other abilities that exist in the Eldar Codex that were never seen because you always had plenty. Well, they're actually somewhat more valuable now because you Fate Dice are just really strong. Getting more of them is a good thing. So those things might become more viable. In addition, they got the Encarn can only teleport in the Eldar's player turn. So if they teleport in the Eldar's player turn and are in front of you, it means that you don't have to be like, oh God, if I kill anything ever this turn, the Encarn teleports away and I don't get to finish it off. Yep. Now you can actually, it's just there, you're gonna kill it if you have enough damage to do so. Um, doesn't mean the Encarn's bad, it just means it's more of a one-way ticket, or you just use it relatively safe for the early turns. Phantasm's D6 instead of flat 6 inches, and that was almost certainly the strongest strat the stratagem mm. in the game. Overall, the options the Eldari player have have been reduced greatly. However, let's remember, going in, they had functionally infinite options. I think they actually did enough to where Eldar are no longer Welcome back to 9th edition. They're no longer S tier. I agree. I don't think they are S tier anymore because mm -hmm. um, a couple of the armies that are going to be up there could already play reasonably into a very good Eldar player. Yep. Now, they probably more often than not will have some sort of advantage in that game. Yep and the Eldar player now has to be almost perfect. Because in 9th edition, if a great Eldar player played you, you would notice. You would feel like you couldn't do anything, but not when every Eldar player played you. <laughs> and if the Eldar player made a mistake, the Eldar player felt it, instead of the Eldar player spent a command point. So, in my opinion, I still think Eldar are very strong. Like I mentioned, because of the, yes, they have less resources. Wraith Guard aren't as good. Night Spinner is kind of side grade. It's more expensive, that's a nerf for sure. But minus two to charge is very strong against some of the units that want to be yeah. doing things. Yeah, better than the Custodius. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, going from a six inch shard to an eight or eight to ten is it's a big deal. So, I think that not only will Eldar lists become more diverse with this, because they can actually think about if they want more resources that do, you know, Fate Dice shenanigans, mm -hmm. or they're going to be even more extreme in terms of, I bring ludicrous amounts of like anti-tank, I bring double avatar, plus, you know, a bunch of some other durable units. For sure. I still think they're going to be one of the stronger armies in the game. Yeah. I have to say they're going to be at A tier. Like they have reroll one hit and one wound as their detachment rule. Yes. That has to be one of the top three detachments. It's quite, it's period. quite good. <laughs> um, I fully agree. I expect Eldar to stay in A tier. Where they fall in A tier, I'm undecided on. I'm of the opinion that they're going to end up being an A tier army that has bad matchups into a couple of other A tier armies. I'm inclined to say that they're actually going to end up in the bottom half of A tier. All right, next up, Greynets. This is an army that typically we have rated higher than the win rate, mm -hmm. and that's not only exclusively Jack. Um, the thing about Grey Knights is they have an amazing suite of stratagems. They do. They have, they have one of the highest, like one of the most annoying strats to play around, Miss of Deimos. And uh, I forget what you said exactly the first time you played against it, but you it was your sisters, and you were like, 
this is, you are really starting to annoy me, or <laughs> something like that, yeah. like tongue in cheek. But yeah. the, the stratagem is, is insanely powerful. Um, on top of that, they have um, a lot of OC and very good central board control when they have those Terminator bricks on there. Their biggest problem is that they were mono dimensional. Now, Grey Knights actually got a unique upgrade in that their data sheet weapon profiles were changed for the heavy side cannon to be AP2 ignores cover and their combat. Uh, on those Dread Knights to be more consistent with uh, uh, three plus weapon skill on the hammer and two plus on the sword. Very, very strong upgrades. And I personally feel that this opens a new dimension for Grey Knights where not only can they have the Terminator units hold down the middle, but now they can bring some real shooting to bear. I love that they gave Grey Knights another way to play. Cause if you want to play Terminator heavy Grey Knights, your army is the same as before, and the rest of the meta got worse. So you got a little better because you know what? If you're playing all Terminator Grey Knights, you didn't enjoy playing against Nurgle Forge Veins in reserves. That would just find you and kill you. And now that's a lot, much less of a problem. Grey Knights are just better at that. But now you have a second option. You can still do Terminator spam if that's what, you know, tickles your fancy, or you can take two, three, four, dr six Dread Knight. And that's a big change. So I, I like these changes for Grey Knights. I had Grey Knights as a below average. I had them in C tier personally, but they got better and then the game got worse around them. And that is a powerful combo. So yeah, I, I could see Grey Knights being significantly better here. I feel that. Um, how better? You think in top of B or lower A? I personally think we're still B tier. Okay. I think it got better. I think the army is hard to play. It's and I think it's unforgiving, but it's not just hard to play in a in a great player can make this army gangster way. I think it's hard to play in a you are constantly mitigating things going wrong, because if you are a great player doing everything you can with Grey Knights, and then Drago fails his six inch charge out of reserves, a thing that just happens. Why would you say that? And the house of cards is inside out in a dumpster. And so I, I feel like even though I think Grey Knights have a lot of room for skill expression, they, I think they have a couple tough matchups still. I think that they still struggle with certain things and are great at certain things, but they still don't have a lot of units. The, the, one of their issues was that they don't have many things on the table. They have better things on the table now, but they do not have more. They don't have they a lot. They don't have they more. certainly don't have a lot. Nothing went down points-wise. You don't get more material, which is fair. Grey Knights should be elite. I think Grey Knights got much better. I'm very excited to see what people do with them. I'm excited to see both yourself and Jack play them. I know both of you guys excited. love that army. Yeah, I love I, it. I want to see more of it for, uh, for both of you guys. I'm inclined to say that they have gone to maybe the probably the top half of B. I don't think they're, they're they're I don't think they're the bottom of B by any stretch. But I don't think that all of their fundamental weaknesses have been removed. I think they're around Chaos Knights, but for an opposite reason. Mm -hmm. It's a board control army that has more tools than Chaos Knights, but doesn't have the same type of consistency into bottom armies. So like Chaos Knights, I feel are very consistent into the armies below them. Yeah. Grey Knights can be inconsistent to those armies below because like you said, a couple things could go wrong. But I think Grey Knights have a higher skill uh, like ceiling mm -hmm. to, than Chaos Knights. That may be true. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of put them around there for opposite reasons. Yeah, I think I think that's a probably a fair assessment. All right, Gene Stealer Cult. This is an army that was one of the top three armies in the game at the beginning of the edition. September update put a big kibosh on that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now they don't auto just get back their battle line units, which was a huge problem because you could just trade them willy nilly in the early game. Yep. And all of a sudden you still have a whole army uh, towards the latter part of the game when people's damage was less. GSC still does a lot of damage, but they do less and have less tricks than before because they can't free strat a bunch of stuff with Nexus. Yep. Now it's only very particular things. Still good things, yep. but very particular things. Yep. They got a very sneaky small buff in the designer's commentary. They also got a very sneaky small nerf in the designer's commentary. Yep. You can't throw one-shot weapons out of an open top transport. That wasn't a huge part of the game plan. You can regenerate models while you're in reserves, but it's while you're in reserves, though, you need movement buffs. But if you wound a neophyte squad, they go into reserves, they come down, they heal a couple guys before they come down. Sure, you got three extra neophyte bodies, that's dope. And you can redeploy a unit with infiltrate. 
and you can redeploy your infiltrate. You can have aberrants or whatever yep. has it. So there, there's some nice things there, but at the end of the day, they're still very similar. I think Jinx Circle did come out of this better. They got pure strange cheaper. That's not a huge deal, frankly, but it's nice. It's the only thing that went down. It's the only point change they had. So I think we're just rock and roll with that. Jinx Circle doesn't feel like they changed much to me. I still feel like they're towards the back half of B tier, if I'm being okay. honest. I'll put them around over here. Okay. Moving on to Imperial Knights. I do love these Imperial Knights too. So Imperial Knights get a bunch of points decreases. Um, you know, none of them like hugely impactful. You're probably getting what, like a, a sub hundred points back in Less the list? Less than hundred. Most lists that I had saved went down 70 to 90 points, depending on the configuration of big knights you're using. And that's nice. That means you can either promote a big knight to a bigger knight, like a castle instead of a crusader, or you could maybe take an agent. You could take an Eversore assassin and turn him into a Warglaive. And that Lalo, the Tyrant upgrade that they got, just, just changes how the reroll works. Instead of reroll a one, you reroll a. Still the same number of rerolls, but now you always get to use it. I think Imperial Knights went up. They were one of the worst armies in the game, but you know what? The game got worse a little bit. They got a small rules change. That was nice, it was cool. Then you get you know, 80, 90 points to play with. It's not bad. I don't think it fundamentally changes the army. And so if your knight army still goes second against someone who can kill you very quickly, you're still in trouble. Where are you feeling for these knights? It's feeling uh, low. It's, it's feeling low, and you know what? I feel bad for this because I, I really do, I don't think knights are a terrible army. I think that they're just not good at cracking the top level, and that's what we're ranking here. I'm inclined to say C tier. Smack in the middle of a Death Watch and Admex sandwich. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not ideal, but... I'm not saying that's where you want to be, but that is where I would put them. Okay. Alright, on to the next. Necrons? Necrons. Tell me about it, Richard. This one is all you. No changes. They got their codex. They have won a significant number of events. They are one of the highest win rate armies in the game, and a lot of top players are doing well. They hyperphase one LVO. There have been other tournaments where Canoptic Court has performed uh, mm -hmm. very well. So this is an army that has multiple builds, and on top of that, it has some things that are just simply too durable for a significant part of this list to really deal with. Six race with a Technomancer, Four Wounds Apiece, Four Up Involm, Five of Fino Pain, Ability to Heal Back, and Catan at T11, 12 Wounds, Half Damage, Five of Fino Pain. When those things are all in front of you, very few armies can say, I can deal with this. I, can, I have enough things that I'm going to kill a couple, I'm going to slow the others down, and I'll be able by two or three turns to have mitigated the pressure, and I'll be fine after that. I personally think that they should have received some amount of points increases, specifically to the Wraiths and the Catans, to just kind of mitigate their most egregious undercosted things, and then see what they do without that. But we didn't do that, so they're going to be an S tier. I think we can just put them right up there. Agreed fully. Um, uh, we will look at where they fit later, but they offer such a difficult task for most armies that the Necron player can kind of turn off their brain, especially the Canoptic Court players. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> and you can kind of just get onto the objectives and just sit there and just walk away, go get some coffee, you know, chill out. And it really doesn't matter what your opponent does. They're not going to kill you quick enough and you yeah. just win the game. Agreed. Hyperphase, I think we need to see more of that data. Yeah. Um, I think you can nerf the common elements of Necrons which is to say that every list has multiple Catan. Yep. <clears throat> because Catan just work in every detachment. Yep. And I think we don't need to see more data on that. But yeah, I would love to see more Hypercrypt data. We know it's very strong. I don't know what to nerf with it yet. Before I made a rules change to Hypercrypt, sure, let's see more. But I think we could point to nerf Catan tomorrow and no one would throw up their hands and say, wait, 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 are you sure? Yep, I'm sure. Now they do have a weakness, which is against fast, aggressive armies if you can get in and kill the Technomancers, or if you have damage manipulation, flat damage plus extra damage, mm -hmm. 
you can actually get through some of these units, especially if you throw real wounds in there, you know, sure. different combat yeah. buffs. Death so wounds, anti. You, you're gonna see there's the two ar other armies that are up there, I think are pretty favorable, especially because the change to how modifiers work to characteristics, things like Trajan are super good into Catan now. Yep. Um, so that's that's an interesting thing, but I definitely think Necrons are one of the strongest armies in the game, and they're too strong because, once again, they just shut out too many things in the game for too easily. I think we're going to run into Necrons being a bit of an Eldar situation, where for the past couple of months, Eldar have not been the only thing on top of the game, but they have been of the top two or three armies. They were the most consistent at beating spots 26 through 5. Uh, so then we have Orcs. Mm -hmm. So Orcs are an army that has performed pretty darn well. They have a solid win rate, and top Orc players have been able to go the distance at certain events. Not consistently, and that's because they have a problem with the sheer size of the army. Five to six trucks, bunch of squig hog boys, some beast bosses. There's no hiding that on most terrain, for, like hiding all of that. You'll hide some of it. And so if you go second in the wrong matchup, like Aldari or CSM with a bunch of Forge Fiends, you just lose a lot of momentum. Orcs project a lot of threat. They have a lot of OC, tons of nonsense, can easily do like a Homer's Cleanse situation and just score a points easily. minimum. And they hit hard enough in combat that they will either chip things down in, um, you know, together as, as multiple units, or they can, you know, have their flash kits, you know, kill half of something, and then they finish it off in combat. I think they were secretly one of the better armies in the game, um, although they don't get like tons of like tons of tournament wins or anything like that. Yeah. They were a strong army because they play the mission supremely well. Agreed. They're comfortably they were comfortably above average in my mind, and they didn't receive any real nerfs. And maybe I think a really good optimized orc list maybe went from 2000 to 2030 not a huge deal and in exchange they got more units that were not seen often getting some points drops but they occasionally fail a stats check and that sometimes that's on offense and sometimes that's on defense i think anything that is playing a middle of the road fair game of warhammer doesn't like playing orcs because they probably do it better than you Good army, though. Yeah, I think they're A tier for sure. A tier for sure. I think they were A tier before. I think they did not really get hit. I think the nerfs they took were inconsequential. That looks perfectly fine to me. I think Orcs rock solid right now. Space Marines. This, in my mind, is the hardest one to rank. Not from a knowledge perspective, I think we have a handle on what Space Marines are. It's just because Space Marines have that, that asterisk of, yeah, but they have seven detachments and six chapters here. <clears throat> How do we rank that? I mean, are we ranking the best of the six chapters in the best of the seven detachments played by an experienced Space Marine player? I think that's the easiest thing to do, yeah. and we can touch on what the other ones, kind of roughly where they would fit with the top player, but <clears> I, I think we take the Vanguard Space Marines and, and talk about, because that's the one where player skill matters the most, in my opinion. You take the Vanguard, you take the Gladius, you take the best chapter units you can. In Codex Space Marines, that is mostly named characters. But you take the best named characters, uh, they're wearing blue armor. And you can make that army really dang good. That list went up 170 points. Mm -hmm. Other than Chaos Space Marines, I believe that is the largest increase that anyone took. I don't think anything besides CSM went up more than 150. But I think that this Ultimate Vanguard list, 170 points, wow, that hurts. I think it's still got it. It's, I... It, I don't think you try to reinvent the wheel. I don't think you say, oh, well, I'll just put in the intercessors and the things that got cheaper. I think you say, all right, my list is worse than before. Technically, that is true. I'm just playing a worse version of the list than before. Anyways. Because a lot of other top stuff went down, I don't think it's anywhere close to the end of the world. I still think Vanguard Marines are one of the best armies in the game. Yeah. I think they're S tier. S? I, yes, absolutely. Bold. I 
I'll admit, I was about to put them at the top of A. I think they're as good as the Gladius. I think they're definitely, I think they're better than Custodes, and I think they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Necrons. Mm -hmm. They have the damage output to do it and the control, but um, I definitely, th if we're gonna rank Gladius up there, then I think we have to put the Vanguard Marines. I think if I was told, John, you have to play one game of Space Marines against an alien to convince them not to invade Earth. <laughs> I think Black Templar Gladius is better. They might be I th better. I think that those you two... You think Custodes and Necrons are both better than them? I, I think Necrons are better. I think Necrons are easier to play, that's, for sure. That's true. But I don't <laughs> think the, if the top Necron player, mm -hmm. if, if it was your Vanguard versus the top Necron player, I'd pick your, your Ultramines every single time. Yeah. Okay. I, I was, personally, I was going to put Vanguard as these, the top army of A. What does the Vanguard struggle with below Vanguard doesn't like just getting pressured. If I go up against a, someone who is willing to just ball out and deploy on the line, I don't think first turn is actually that punishing. I agree Ultimate Vanguard is one of the top lists in the game. I think that they're always riding a little bit of that knife's edge when they've got so many tools, everything is great, a good player can make it work, see the plays. But if someone decides, I'm just gonna try to get lucky, and it works, I think I've experienced the Vanguard House of Cards. The rest of Space Marines, I think Iron Storm still can be good, but doesn't have that same upper limit. Um, I think Firestorm is a little limited, and I think the things it was relying on got hit pretty hard, and it doesn't have as good of a backup plan. I think Gladius is still phenomenal. The Templar Gladius is the best one. But Ultramarine Gladius, Dark Angel Gladius, still pretty good. Still pretty good. Um, yeah. Still be very willing to take that to a tournament, rock out, get some good results. Space Wolves. We've mentioned them a couple times. They did get their detachment rule upgraded so that you can do the, um, you, you can, can accomplish your, your deeds. Mm -hmm. um, at, what is it, end of your turn? At the end of any turn any instead turn. of the end of a battle round. Yeah. This is not that impactful because exactly. those rules just aren't very good. As we discussed in our Codex review, or not Codex, the Data Slate review, this, it, you're getting, you're walking extra miles just to get a mediocre buff that other characters or like yeah. stratagems or whatever just give you. The problem is that the Space Wolf player is accomplishing no deeds because on turn one they're not having a character kill a character in combat. But even if they do it like turn three, they get maybe two turns out of a mediocre rule, just let them get a solid passive buff depending on which one they choose and then they get a really good one when they achieve it. I think they need their Warlord needs to pick a buff for the army and they get it there's, there, there's four deeds right yep. the warlord picks one of the deeds at the beginning of the battle and says the army has it while i'm alive it's from the top you just you have this while i'm alive and then you still can unlock more but you instead of starting with the zero struggle to catch a buff just start with one rule that you get for five turns i think the buffs still are very mediocre personally. yes and then they are taking space brain nerfs by existing which is insulting. I think the best Space Wolf list is you take a Gladius detachment and you put Ragnar in it. Yeah, Gladius Space Wolves are totally fine. I, I've played against it. It's an okay army, but totally I, solid. I think that is worse than taking a Gladius and putting Azrael in it. I think it's worse than Death Watch. Is it worse than Knights or Admech? I don't think so. Probably not, because no. Space Marine data sheets are still pretty Space better. Marine data sheets aren't bad. They get a lot better when you add a Kalgar and Sword Brethren, but they're not bad. So that's where they land. All right, Tau. So C -tier. This is near and dear to your heart, Ricky. All I right. know you're excited the to talk about Tau. Forces of the Tau Empire. This is an army that, in my opinion, in the hands of a top player, could punch up into any of the armies in the game. Not easily, through a lot of effort and very particular lists, you could do it, but it certainly wasn't easy. And the consistency of the army was not there because they had weirdly hard matchups, especially going second into certain armies. Certain threat overlord armies, whether orcs, chaos knights, um, I guess, you know, death guard, um, chaos space marines, obviously, black templar gladius. All the top armies were hard. Yeah, 
If they get the first turn and are set up staged in the center, that was very hard to interact with due to the threat ranges of those armies. So um, what did Tau do well though, is that they have one of the stronger shooting units that you couldn't interact with. Mm -hmm. Not as strong as Wraith Guard, but still quite strong. And um, that alone was enough to propel them above a lot of the mid-tier and below armies. Just having super non-interactive shooting that could kill a lot of things in the game was very good, and Tau Access ignores cover very easily on relatively good AP weapons. Now they have very big problems splitting fire with units, so things with a lot of guns don't really split efficiently. So if you spend most of your damage in like two units, you don't really deal with the overload armies that were typical, the MSU armies towards the top. Yeah. And this update further pushes you towards MSU. Solo commanders are a completely viable option. Crisis suits are much more expensive. You really never want to run them as a three man anymore. And if you do run a six, it's only one six man. So you have a lot of other stuff uh, outside of that. Uh, Riptides got significantly cheaper, which means they are just a very good, relatively durable unit that has good data sheet upgrades and has solid enough shooting. I frankly think Tau are certainly A tier um, because I think they can play into a lot of the armies up there and they have a lot of stuff and a lot of things that can all do damage out of nowhere. They really love the fact that um, Wraith Guard are nerfed because that was the hardest part of Eldar. Yep. And also Night Spinners don't stop you from advancing. They do give you minus two to move in advance, which is annoying, but it's not stopping them from advancing and they move a lot farther against Eldar. Yep. I think because those armies got nerfed, that's the biggest buff to Tau. It's like those okay. strong top armies were hard to play into and they are worse. Yep. I think Riptide's cheaper, Crisis more expensive, ends up being a very small buff to Tau. A tier. 100%. I think Tau are good. Next up, T Suns. Zero changes to T Suns, only the demon ally tweaks, which aren't massively impactful but are minorly inconvenient. Yep. But then the rest of the meta maybe crept down a little bit, and there's probably a little less indirect in the game because all the indirect went up once. I think T Suns are phenomenal. They are one of the armies that already did, I already mentioned it, like GSC, they did a lot of damage, and they still have most of that damage intact. Yep. What they don't have is a lot of units, but if you use your units perfectly, you do insane amounts of damage to people, and especially these armies at the top, they want to be on objectives. And Thousand Suns get a lot stronger with stuff on objectives. Thousand Suns hit very hard, they don't have a lot of units, and that the worst thing that could happen to a T-Suns player was they go second, or they or something happens, and they lose resources too quickly. And once that happens, they snowball. Because the T-Suns army was so synergistic, if they lost a key piece early, more than they were planning on, it would get worse and worse and worse. The damage would go down, and they would be playing the game, and they would be scoring it. And they're not screening it. Oh my god, I just got run over. The indirects, specifically things like Whirlwinds, Exorcist, Plague Burst Crawlers, all this stuff going up means that the, if your opponent isn't taking three of them anymore, it's significantly worse into yeah. those armies. Still good, but like not yeah. ludicrously good. Two of an indirect piece isn't the same, because there's a very few indirect pieces in the game that can one-shot a dedicated transport. And there's a lot of indirect pieces in the game that can two-shot a dedicated transport. And if there are only two indirect pieces and they, the first Manticore wounds the Rhino, the second Manticore kills the Rhino, all the Rubik Marines spill out of the Rhino, and we're out of Manticores. Okay, cool. Right, sure. I got my turn. <laughs> we made it through. <laughs> we lost the Rhino, on to the next. <laughs> I think T-Suns love the meta changes, and I think they were, they're hard to play. But I think they were better than people thought. I, I personally am terrified of T-Suns. Look, look at this. A lot of the armies towards that S and A tier want to just have a bunch of stuff on objectives. And Thousand Suns love to see it. Kill that. They, yeah. You try and threat overload Thousand Suns, and they're like, challenge accepted. Where are you thinking? Based on it, I assume you're thinking A tier. I'm thinking, yeah, I don't think, I think they're the lower end of A tier because they still have problems. Their problems are they are very low stuff count, and as they lose stuff, their army gets worse. T 
Tyranids, another faction that... Uh, I love Tyranids. Like. The Tyranids are my favorite army in the game. Um, they, they got nerfed, which wasn't what I was expecting. But Tyranids are really dang good. They're just, they're hard to play and they're another army that has a couple of problems that sometimes keep them down, but they are not bad. They got point increases on the auto-take units, which is painful, but also, you know what? They were the auto-take units. Unfortunately, GW saw a couple units being taken every time and decided to kick out the crutch rather than maybe shore up the rest of the book a lot, but they did give as well as they took. A couple of units, notably Tyranifex, Screamer Killer Carnifex, got cheaper to the point that I'm willing to take them. That actually got cheaper. That is, I'll put that in the list now, cheaper. And so I think that balances out the fact that they got some points nerfs to the, the auto-take units. They got some love in it return. I think Tyranids ended up very neutral in a world where their worst matchups got worse. I, as a as a Tyranid player, I didn't take them to Worlds because I felt like as soon as I hit a good Eldar player with Triple Night Spinner who had played the game before, I would lose. Now, Necrons is an army that is very hard for Tyranids to deal with, but Necrons aren't tabling yet, and if you give a Tyranid player five turns to figure things out, they're gonna score some points. They can make that game close, and if I can make the game close, I can sneak a win. So I think Tyranids' relative spot moved up a little. I think that the things Tyranids got are pretty useful though, because the Tyranids are great at scoring secondaries, they're great at scoring primaries, they're great at screening, they're great at body blocking and tagging. Wow, this army's great at everything, except dealing damage. Uh, they're fine at dealing damage, they're better than Admech. <laughs> um, they should get what I've mentioned a couple times, which is just some sh weapon strength changes yep. to just open up a different dimension to the army. The things that Tyranids have trouble with, there are a couple of stat checks that are problematic. That damage output is good, it's not great, and it relies a heavy amount on opponents failing Battleshock tests. So I have personally run into scenarios where a Black Templar Land Raider has deployed on the line and gone first. Now I've never gone first when I've seen a Black Templar Land Raider deployed on the line. I'd like to know how that feels sometime, but uh, not yet. I've had this happen to me multiple events in a row. It's a little painful. <laughs> That's a problem. That's a big problem. It's hard to block because it overwatches like a mother. If it happens to fail its Battleshock tests, we're gaming. If it happens to pass its Battleshock tests, I don't have a plan B. But then I think the things that they got better, like the Screamer Killer card effects, actually helped that a lot. Because the Screamer Killer introduces Battleshock in a new phase. The Screamer Killer is a new phase of Battleshock that is worth taking. And so I think Tyranid's net, very small buff, and their, op, their, their biggest problems toppled. I'm still thinking B tier. Really? But I, I, really? Man. I would put them around sisters. Really? Yes. Okay. Ooh. Richard has so much faith in me. This is very nice. Not yet. This, other Tyranid players have done very well. Oh, Alex has done very well in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Pope did really well at LVO. Yep. All with different style lists, That's too. True. There's a lot of depth to this, and I think the Gargoyle alone Oh, is bonkers. such a ludicrous tool that if you have a modicum <laughs> of talent at this game, you will take gargoyles into the next dimension, and you cannot lose, it, cannot get blown out if you have multiple gargoyle units. It's so hard to do. I think this army like plays the mission game mm -hmm. at least as good as sisters. And if we're putting sisters there, we have to put we have to put them. Otherwise, we have to drop sisters down to B. <sighs> Whole thing, okay. Um, if you're putting Tyranids yeah, in B, okay, okay, okay. no All way right. sisters are up there. Look, if we're putting Tyranids high, who am I to because disagree? Because the thing is, I love Tyranids. Put them Tyranids up. have the rules to introduce very high skill cap plays. They do. So, they absolutely do. And you are one of the people who can pull them off. Mm -hmm. I play against other Tyranid players all the time, and they don't do any of those plays, and I just run through them. But as soon as you are a top player playing this army, there are so many tricky things that you can do to delay your opponent, yep. mitigate. And this is how they're similar to Admin. That's right. Is those tools are very good as a top player that you can exercise. Mm -hmm. Tyranids just happen to have those extra dimensions, specifically a lot of battle shock tests and the synergies mm -hmm. from them that take them up to do more than that. You know what, Richard? Put them in eight tier. Leagues of OTAN, so they were an army that, in my opinion, had a false win rate. 
and that was because they did very well into the armies below them mm -hmm. and struggled into top armies like Eldar with Phantasm and Wraithguard, Night Spinners. What is this slow army doing? There's no real assault weapon, there's very few assault weapons in the army. And oh, the Night Spinners aren't doing much then, you don't have to advance. <laughs> I need to still get to places, uh -huh. and a lot of units move five inches, and if your opponent has screens and is smart, they will push back your reserves, you'll come in where you don't want to, and you'll be out of the game, or you'll kill one thing and just be out of the game the rest of the time. Yep. So they were very punishing against good players, is how I felt personally playing them. I agree. And this is why I didn't see them win very many events. They might win a GT here and there, but they weren't winning giant events. Uh, they were often getting just absolutely, when you would look at them, they're winning, 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 and then, oh, they played the good Eldar player, utterly smashed. So I thought that their win rate was inflated by beating armies blow, which is definitely a metric that deserves some attention. Yeah. So they got a couple points increases. Hearthguard went up 20 for the 10-man unit. The um, Reasonable. The broke gear guys went up 20 for the, the six-man unit, and the, um, the Sagittar went up 15. You so, have a small buff, right, in the call now giving ignore mods being better than before. The Grim Demeanor that guy. is now actually works against damage mods. So Plasma is back on the table, so you can have a high AP weapon in there that ignores um, Armor of Contempt, which is absolutely a problem for Votan, and also half or minus damage. So that's a nice buff. You are going to have about 100 less points uh, in your list, maybe slightly more, depending on how many Sagittars you were running. But effectively now, two Sagittars is one land fort. I think you just swap a Roo into the land fort, which ignores cover as a bonus, and is just tougher. Okay. And you play a pretty darn similar game, and because the other armies, especially Eldar, went down, mm -hmm. this is net a buff for Votan. I feel pretty good about Votan, honestly, going into the new meta. I, I agree with you on the win rate previously being inflated. I think that they didn't really get much worse at all. Like a little bit worse in line with the meta sliding down is fine. I personally think that Votan struggles to express a lot of high skill plays. Every time I played against Votan with another army that I thought was pretty good, I found that I was, oh man, there's so much stuff. Oh man, there's so much stuff. Oh man, I just broke through. We finally got enough Sagittars down. They have a whiffy turn because their initial grudge targets are dead. I have not been letting my, my best units get grudged. They suddenly are shooting me and hitting on fours without a lot of rerolls, and we have made it through to the other side and I've been able to scrape a better score than I thought I was gonna get right at the end of it. Personally think Votan are like, I think they're just upper B tier. You're 100% right. I think they're upper B tier. I don't think they're as good as most of those A tier armies. world eaters so i think that we're going to treat this a little more fairly than some other people because um this i've heard i've heard the end of the it, some are saying that the world is ending for world eaters but i don't think so they were ludicrously strong they were unforgiving mm -hmm. and if world eaters ever had something go wrong it went wrong a lot and so we saw a lot of world eaters just lose games because they just got shot, didn't go first, deployed on the line, ran straight at someone while screaming and holding an axe above their head and then died. Angron didn't come back immediately like he usually does. Yeah, it's incredible <laughs> that Angron, you only have one Angron a game, that's unfair. I feel like you should have at least four. And we saw that world leaders did go up in points. A world leaders list went up in the ballpark of 100. I'm sure some builds went up 110, some went up 80, just into that ballpark. They went up. They didn't go up an insane amount, but world leaders don't have a lot of data sheets to choose from. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the world leader forge fiend went down, I think is very funny, but there just aren't a lot of data sheets to choose from with world leaders. And so what's it going to be? Like are eight bound went up, am I taking less eight bound? Apparently not. They also took the nerf to the enhancements. Two of their enhancements got hit. Both of it, it was trying to make an unreliable thing more reliable. It didn't make it all the way reliable. You know, one of them, uh, one of those enhancements let them reroll one blood god Yahtzee roll of battle round. One of them made a master of executions plus one, I think, attacks and damage, and then D3 on the charge. Yep. And that went just all always one, and now it's one reroll per game of the blood tithe Yahtzee roll. 
but this is still an insanely hard-hitting army that stages very, very well, goes very fast, and your opponent has to be thinking about the scams the whole time. For the World Leader player, this changes everything. For the World Leader opponent, this changes nothing. I am still thinking that character with a big axe kills everything it kills, like everything that it hits as far as I'm concerned, and Engron might come back at any moment. I've watched multiple games where world leaders go first, the opponent tries to set up, world leaders then move, advance, move, plus two move, advance and charge, get into the opponent, kill enough stuff, tie up a bunch of things, the opponent can't fall back in the key places, and the game is just over. Two turns, your opponent got to set up and then just lost. That is not a army that it was designed to play a five turn game of 40k where it's interactive, it's fun, it's both, both players are making decisions. It was too much of luck sacking, in my opinion, and deserved the nerfs. I think World Leaders, I really want to see a World Leaders Codex approach the army differently. I don't want it, and I think it's less likely that World Leaders hit the windmill slam turn to the game is over than before. But also, that means it is less likely that World Leaders can claw out of a bad spot, but the two are intrinsically tied together because the only thing the army does is run you over. I, I think they're, they're, they're worse than before. The reliability aspect is going to make it harder to make a top run with them. Yep. I think they're still not bad. I'm inclined to say that they are in the realm of Votan. I, yeah, I was about to put them ahead of, think, right ahead of Votan. I think I'm okay with ahead. Overall, I mean, once again, the game is pretty, like, we got- It's condensed. Nobody in D tier, we got four armies in C tier, and a good detachment upgrade and or removing some of the nerfs to Death Watch and Imperial Knights will just get them back up. Yeah. So we're not far from just having almost everybody be in A and B. Yeah, we really, this is the flattest I think we've had, and again, those C tier armies, I think are capable of, they're all capable of punching up against some of the things above them. They do. None of the C tier armies feel hopeless. I still, if we put Adamek last, someone had to be last. I think Adamek is more capable of beating A tier armies than any bottom of the list has been this edition. Not saying it's happening to 50% of the time. No. <laughs> or even, <laughs> even 49, but we have been in many places where the bottom army is a no-hoper, and I don't yep. think we're there. Yep. I don't think that's true for Admech. I think Admech has the worst army in the game, where we put him right now, is better of a worse army than anyone else has been. Yeah. The overall game balance, this feels like we're headed towards the best version of 10th. So far, not the best possible. Nope. We'll see what GW can do. We've got a couple more codexes. We've got some more balance updates in the next couple months. Yep. This feels like it was, we're not sprinting down the trail, but this was a good step in the right direction again. Yep. And, and several in a row. I like the direction of reducing the insane damage output of yes. armies so that games play out. I'm quite happy with where we're at right now. I'm happy with that tier list we just put up. And, uh, well, we're going to be doing a lot more talking about 40k. This balanced data slate is new. That means we've got a lot of new content coming your way. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you actually like it. Click that button. Mm -hmm. Leave a comment. I know you disagree with one of our takes. Let us know in the comment section. We'll be in there, uh, just like we're in, you know, the, the live chat for this video. And make sure you subscribe to the channel. That'll get you notified every time we go live. And trust me, we go live a lot. We normally go live five times a week with free Warhammer 40,000 content when we don't have a balanced state of slate landing in our laps and turning the house upside down, but there's a lot to go off of. So make sure that you check out the rest of our channel as well. Check out that link in the description below. The warroom.vhx.tv is where you can get a free three day trial to the warroom. Yep, absolutely. The warroom.vhx.tv. Try it out. There's battle reports in there with all of us playing the different ideas and lists we've been talking about. There's battle reports for all of those armies and multiple ones. So check them out. In addition, we have um, a lot of theory videos. We have a lot of uh, tips. If you're newer, there's a lot of tip videos for just getting you to understand the fundamentals of the game. And we have a lot of people coming from other games, other competitive games like Magic the Gathering, joining our community and trying to take their 40K knowledge from 
just a little bit or casual to I am doing well in tournaments mm -hmm. and that is what the worm is designed uh, to do. So um, if you want to, please do try out that three-day free trial and join our community and uh, start making new friends right now. There you go. Thank you so much for watching everyone. We'll see you next time. So long for now.